Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's video we're going to be talking about something controversial which is every time I open my mouth and talk about neurological disorders and leopard geckos somebody's upset so <laughs> that's the only reason it's controversial. But today I'm going to be talking about enigma syndrome versus white and yellow syndrome. Now I have two separate in-depth videos about white and yellow syndrome and about enigma syndrome. I will leave them up on the screen throughout this video and down in the description. Please watch those videos if you are unfamiliar with either Enigma syndrome or white and yellow syndrome or if you feel like you need a refresher. As a bit of a backstory, I am someone who's been keeping leopard geckos since 2015 and I've been keeping geckos with neurological issues since 2016 and a lot of them have uh, Enigma syndrome or white and yellow syndrome. So I'm, I feel like I'm quite capable to talk about the subject, although a lot of people don't like when I do. Breeders. Breeders don't like when I do. Before we get started, I have a few disclaimers. One, if you feel like your gecko has a neurological disorder, please don't automatically classify them as having white and yellow syndrome or enigma syndrome based on what you see in this video. Number two, please note that both of these conditions are two very different things and I plan to address that in the video. So before you run down to the comments and type, how could you compare them? They're so different. That's the point. I'm going to literally talk about how different they are throughout this video. Number three, this is not meant to insult anyone who keeps or breeds enigmas or white and yellows. This is not meant to share any misinformation. And for anyone who feels like I have done wrong in sharing my experience about them, please let me know respectfully down below. Or, you know, you can we can have a conversation in DMs if you prefer that. Again, I don't do this with any ill will. It is simply to educate people because a lot of people will see a gecko with a neurological issue or sometimes not even with a neurological issue at all, like just poor vision. And they'll mean say oh it has enigma syndrome oh it has white and yellow syndrome and we have to be very careful when we use those words because they have intention behind them and if you're calling a gecko that is not an enigma a gecko with enigma syndrome it's completely false if you're saying a gecko has white and yellow syndrome but you have no basis to say that it can be harmful so again i just be very clear this is not to cause harm to anyone who does enjoy keeping these morphs or who breeds them. This is not to shame or shade or whatever. I also want to make sure that everybody knows not to use these words loosely for their leopard geckos. Now with all that said, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all the good stuff. Consider supporting us on Patreon or by becoming a channel member. All that stuff out of the way. Let's go ahead and get started. Now we're going to start with a compare contrast chart essentially. I'll actually like put a picture of it on the screen of what I wrote down. But in the Enigma syndrome side, Enigma syndrome can only be found in geckos of the Enigma morph. It is specifically linked to that gene. Like it is not something you'll see in a gecko that is not an Enigma. However, that is not the case with white and yellow syndrome. The white and yellow morph itself is not inherently problematic like Enigma because you can have tons of white and yellows that don't have any syndrome. But there are some out there that have the syndrome and the reason that it is in some and not others is because it is a condition that is passed down from gecko to gecko and not just because of morph. So say for example, you have a leopard gecko that is a white and yellow paired to a non-white and yellow and they mate and they have two offspring. One is, you know, phenotypically a white and yellow, looks like a white and yellow, doesn't have a syndrome. And then you have one that doesn't look like a white and yellow and it does have a syndrome. It's just because the syndrome can be passed regardless of whether it's attached to the morph from parent to offspring. Whereas with Enigma, that doesn't happen. If Enigma is paired with a non-Enigma and one baby comes out Enigma and one comes out not Enigma, the not Enigma is not going to have the syndrome and the Enigma can. This is why you'll see people often say like Enigmas should never be bred. Even people who work with white and yellow will say Enigmas should not be bred and that's because they understand as many people do that Enigma is problematic inherently because the disorder is attached to what causes the Enigma to look the way that it does right? The striking appearance of an enigma that everybody likes because it is beautiful. We understand that it cannot be removed. You can't have an enigma, multiple lines of enigmas, multiple generations without it popping up. That's just not the case. And there are breeders who say they have multiple lines of, of geckos that are enigmas without syndrome. But a gecko that is an enigma should always come with the disclaimer that this gecko at some point in time can have a neurological disorder or could produce offspring that have neurological disorders because it is inherently tied to the gene. Now with white and yellow that is not the case as I previously stated but the good thing about that is a lot of ethical breeders have been able to remove 
the syndrome from those lines. And initially it all came because of inbreeding, unfortunately. A lot of things come from inbreeding, unfortunately. But because they were able to take white and yellows that had the visual appearance of a white and yellow and did not have the syndrome and paired them to geckos who also did not have any sort of neurological issues, they were able to get white and yellow offspring that did not and would not ever have the chance for a neurological disorder and neither would their offspring. So those one big difference between enigma and white and yellow. And again, to summarize, Enigmas have the chance for the syndrome, so do their offspring, as long as they have the enigma gene. White and yellow, not the case. White and yellow can have a perfectly healthy, capable line of all white and yellow geckos that don't have a syndrome. And sometimes, unfortunately, you will have lines of white and yellows that do have a syndrome. It just comes down to the ethics of the breeder in that case. Another key difference between enigma syndrome and white and yellow syndrome is that enigma syndrome often worsens with age or with poor health or with stress. Whereas with white and yellow syndrome, Geckos born with it usually have like a pretty noticeable case and then it gets better with time. And also white and yellow syndrome doesn't seem to get worse with a poor health event or a stressful event. Like for example, if you have an enigma that breeds, especially if it's like a female enigma, it often causes their symptoms to get worse. Whereas with white and yellow, that's not really the case. They'll kind of be the same as before. The symptoms for white and yellow syndrome and enigma syndrome are different. In enigmas, you will have circling, you'll have head bobbing, head tilting, stargazing, death rolling. With white and yellow syndrome, it's more of like an equilibrium issue where they have like big over-exaggerated movements and they won't circle, they won't death roll, but they'll kind of just like teeter-totter in their movements. Sometimes they can have like a really exaggerated jump forward and then they'll just be walking normal. And sometimes they can get spooked and they'll like throw their head back and then pull it back down. That can happen with enigmas as well, the rapid like head movement. But with enigmas, you're gonna see stargazing, you're gonna see circling, you're gonna see death rolling. Those are more common symptoms. Hey everyone, I'm coming to you for the voiceover because I wanna show you guys some of the symptoms of Enigma Syndrome and White and Yellow Syndrome. So this is my gecko, Shireen, who is no longer with us, but I still use videos of her for educational purposes. This is her stargazing. As you can see, she is holding her head in an elevated position for a long period of time, kind of looking at the stars, hence the name. This is my gecko, Gilly, who is circling. This is literally just what circling looks like. Sometimes it can be rapid movements, sometimes it can be slow movements, but it is where the gecko will continuously move in a circular pattern. This is a very old clip. Um, you know, her husbandry is a bit different, so you might notice that. And this is Eddard also stargazing. As you can see, he's kind of in a really weird position, just holding his head straight up for a long period of time. I don't have any footage of my gecko death rolling. However, this is Melisandre after a death roll when she was upside down. Death rolling is where they roll around on the ground rapidly and they'll often end up on their backside like this. Here's a photo of my gecko Marcella who is in the middle of a circle. She doesn't actually show symptoms very often so I don't have any video of her. And this is Melisandre doing a bit of stargazing again in a very weird position. Now onto white and yellow syndrome. This is my gecko Theon as a baby. He actually is not visually a white and yellow, but he does have a sibling who is white and yellow. So he's one of the examples of how, you know, they can have the syndrome without actually being a white and yellow. But as you can see, he was a very reactive baby. And here he's a lot less reactive to touch, but you'll see here in a second that he actually just has a very exaggerated movement and then falls over. So he has gotten better with age. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of white and yellows do tend to get better with age, but their symptoms will always be there. It's just going to be less prevalent oh there he goes and then this is my gecko canvara on the day she arrived as you can see she does a bit of over exaggerated head bobbing that's pretty common for white and yellows and pretty common for canvara and then here's another clip of her later on after she moved into her enclosure doing a bit of head bobbing and reacting to my own movements she's very reactive i think it's because she's so food motivated personally now the difference in their care is that enigmas can be more challenging to take care of. My white and yellows are way easier than my enigmas. Enigmas can be challenging to feed because they can have a really, really hard time aiming. Whereas aim really isn't such an issue with white and yellows. The event of eating itself can be super stressful for an enigma. And like the more and more they try to eat, the more and more they become stressed. And this can cause them to become disinterested in continuing trying to eat because they've just become so worked up and stressed out. And you'll also see like heightened symptoms in these situations as well. Whereas with a white and yellow, they typically get food on the first try. They can be really overexcited about eating and you might notice heightened like head bob or like uh, like a exaggerated movement 
during feeding, but they typically don't have a hard time aiming or getting the food on the first try. Now, those are some of the key differences between the Enigmas and the white and yellows that I've noticed. In general, white and yellows fare better. They just have less symptoms, their symptoms are not likely to get worse with their stress, and in general, because you can remove the syndrome from the lines of white and yellow, it's a more ethical morph to breed as well. Whereas with Enigma, the condition often gets worse with age or stress or ovulation or a poor health event. The geckos themselves usually have more symptoms and it can't be removed from the lines. And I know, again, there are breeders who say they have multiple lines that don't have Enigma syndrome. It's just not the case, unfortunately. A lot of respectable breeders who have worked with geckos for decades will say, right on their websites or right on their pages, they don't work with Enigmas because years of efforts have proven that Enigmas will continue to have neurological issues regardless of how many times you try to outbreed it. Two very different situations. Now, they have a couple things in common. One is the fact that they're both neurological conditions. And two, that white and yellows are often crossed with enigmas. Enigmas already have problems. Why would you want to add a potential problem to that? But again, that goes back to the ethics of breeding reptiles in the first place. But sometimes you'll see geckos that are enigma and white and yellow cross. And then that is a whole mess. Two of the like weirdest enigmas I've had have been white and yellows crossed with enigmas. In fact, one of them passed away. Her name is Shireen. The other one I have right now, her name is Roz. Both of them had like very similar body structure. They don't hold weight well. They were missing their tail tips from bad stuck shed. They have worsened symptoms with ovulation and they had both pretty severe cases of enigma syndrome despite young ages. Like, I don't know why anybody would want to cross white and yellow with Enigma when white and yellow can on itself be a healthy, beautiful morph. So that's just another topic for another day. But you might come across someone who has a Enigma cross with a white and yellow, and then that can kind of leave the door open for a whole host of issues. One thing that my Enigma white and yellow cross does that none of my other Enigmas do, unless they're like super stressed, is... Roz immediately resorts to going catatonic. She closes her eyes, stretches her legs out, and her whole body becomes stiff. And that's like if I interact with her, like try to get stuck shed off her or check her for ovulation or for eggs or something like that. Her whole body just goes stiff immediately. Whereas with the enigmas, they tend to get like a little bit worked up before that happens. She just immediately is like, nope, I can't handle it. And so just something to keep in mind if you do come across an enigma, white and yellow, there are chances that you could get a gecko that's really neurologically unstable or unwell. So that's the end of this video. There are a lot of differences between Enigma syndrome and white and yellow syndrome. They're two completely different things. Sometimes you will see geckos that are crossed with both, like I said, Roz, for example, or Shireen. But for the most part, they are two very different things. And I want everyone to be very aware of that, especially when they're using that language to describe their gecko, especially if they don't know the morph of their gecko. If you don't know the morph of your gecko and you don't know it's like familial genetics or like, you know, it's grandparents and things like that, you can't say for sure what it is then you should not be saying it has this specific neurological disorder. If you think your gecko has neurological issues, that's completely fine. I'm not trying to tell you otherwise. Just be careful about what you call it. And also, sometimes people think their geckos have neurological issues when in fact they're just like really bad hunters. That's a whole separate issue. But just be very aware of the language you're using because it is very important to make sure you are not misrepresenting something. So that's the end of this video. I hope you found this informational and insightful. If you did, let me know down below with a like, a comment, a subscribe, all that good stuff. And please, please, please check out the other videos I have about white nail syndrome and enigma syndrome. They are going to be much more in depth than this video is, which is just a comparison video. So please, again, those are down below. Please check them out. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.